morning. Good morning. So good to be with you here this morning. Um, before we jump into the sermon, I just want to remind us all that there is a unique opportunity, a wonderful opportunity we have to exercise of our civil freedoms on Tuesday. I uh, just encourage you, if you are of age and able, to go out and vote and exercise that freedom of which we have. And with that being said, let's pray because we need it. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we are so grateful that you do love us. Never lose sight of that, Lord. And may your word show even more this morning that you love us. May you speak to us through your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. So a couple questions to start here this morning. The first is, is uh, how many of you, whether uh, individually uh, or with your group this week, you studied the passage that I'll be preaching on this morning? How many of you did that? Okay, all right. How many after studying that passage, you had some questions uh, about that passage? Anybody? Okay, second sermon in a row that you didn't need me. Um, so, so I'll start for me this morning. Um, now, one of the questions, should you have had some questions, nonetheless, would have been, which poor pastor has to preach on this sermon this morning, okay? Now, that's me. What's funny, though, is that when Adam was putting together the preaching schedule, uh, uh, I actually wanted this passage. I wanted this. Uh, because in all of my years of hearing sermons on giving, uh, sermons on generosity, sermons on tithing, I can't for the life of me understand why no preacher may have ever used this particular sermon or this passage to preach on this topic, okay? Because at the heart of what's really going on here, and we're talking about generosity, there's actually something more that we need to pay attention to. It's that what God really wants from us is a pure heart of generosity, a pure heart of generosity. And so I want to set the context for us here this morning. If you have your Bibles, and I hope you do, uh, turn to Acts chapter 4, and we're going to start at verse 32. If you need a Bible, raise your hand nice and high, and one of our ushers will get it to you. Because what I want to do is help us to understand the context of which we, uh, which this topic that I'm going to cover this morning on is in, because it'll help you understand the whole picture. So I want to read 32 through 35. It said, all the believers were in one heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there were no needy persons among them. For from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales and put it at the apostles' feet. And it was distributed to anyone who had need. And so what we see off the bat is we see this community which is other-centered. It's selfless. It's this beautiful give, uh, giving community unto one another as they see their needs. You see the beauty of that there are those who had a lot and those who didn't have as much and those who had a lot sacrificed in such a way in order to lift up the people within that church community so that none of them had any need among them. Uh, and Mark talked a little bit last week about uh, our culture is this culture built around the, the central piece of self. We are a selfish culture. Now, it's one thing for us to talk about that in here and then go out there and try to live selflessly, but I'm going to tell you, I think that has to start in this gathering. I think that has to start in this place. Is there any way of which the self-centeredness of culture creeps into what we are doing here week in and week out? You know, uh, I'll give you maybe an example is, is what's missing. Uh, there are some things that are missing from the description of the early church that we notice they're not getting so caught up in that sometimes I think we do. Stuff like, man, I really wish that pastor preached in jeans. Or I really like the color palette ba you know, backdrop of the shiplap behind the guy on the stage. Or, man, I'm really glad that we're in this industrial building and maybe not something that is more goth you know, gothically designed. I think we focus so much on the wrong stuff that it becomes preferential rather than what the early church was all about in, its, uh, in, it, in, the, in the young infant years uh, of it. And what it was about was God's people gathered around God's word to worship together in order to spur one another on towards love and good deeds, to equip, equip them unto di discipleship, to bring God's kingdom into the world, and to use their purposes in the church for giving unto one another in that community. 
Because one of the things that I could, we could probably bet on is the reason why they knew one another's needs is because they knew one another's names. Is they knew one another's names. They got close enough to other people. That's why we are constantly saying, hey, it's really nice that you gather here, you hang for us with us for an hour a week or so, get into a small group because that's where real stuff's going to happen. That's where real life change is going to happen. That's where accountability is going to happen. That's where you get close enough to people of which you can know their names and you can give to them if they have need and they can give to you if you have need. That's why we created the Axe Fund. That's why we have some of you who have so generously given to that cause that if there's anybody within our context that needs uh, financial needs, reach out to the church. Don't be too proud. That's what it's there for. And so it's a beautiful picture of that community, and that is the context of which we are going to start with here this morning. And as we go through the rest of this passage into chapter 5, we're going to see three things. We're going to see a pure giver, we're going to see an impure giver, and we're going to see the purest giver. We're going to see a pure giver, an impure giver, where we will spend most of our time, and then finally we will see the purest giver. And so let us start this morning by looking at a pure giver, starting in Acts chapter 4, verses 36 through 37. It says, Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, and that's what we'll refer to him as this morning, which means son of encouragement, sold the field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. So we get these pictures of what Luke is giving to us. Is first we see this being done in a community, and then we see a guy named Barnabas, who, who has a piece of property, and he sells it, and he gives the money, and he puts it at the apostles' feet. Now, what's interesting is, you know, the fact that they sold the money, and they brought it to the leadership of the church in order to discern with wisdom of how to distribute that among them. It's not like they took, you know, money from one really rich person and gave it to another really rich person. They didn't do that. In much of the same way, we have a biblical structure here that you guys so graciously give to us, and we have a variety of teams. We have uh, the Axe Fund team. We have the missions team. We have our stewardship team. We have our elder board in order to decide and discern and pray about how it is that we are to distribute the money that you guys have so graciously given. Now, one of the things that's very interesting is that Barnabas, he saw that there was a need. He sold his land, and he gave to it. And that seems to be true of everybody else in chapter four. And so what we see is that, one thing I want to point out to us is that it doesn't seem like there's a whole lot of compulsion or direct uh, instruction from the apostles that they have to do this. They are doing it out of the overflow and the cheerfulness of their heart to give in such a unique way. So what makes his giving pure? Well, the first is, is that he gave all that he said he would. Doesn't seem to be much of an anticipation of reciprocation. You know, I'm going to give to you so that you guys will get back to me. He saw a need. He saw he could meet that need. And he met that need with what he had. Now, the question we really want to ask ourselves is how do we know he really did it with a pure heart? I am so glad you asked. I am just so glad. Because what Luke does in this passage from chapter 4 into chapter 5 is he gives us a comparison case between. God's people, this guy named Barnabas, and this couple that we're about to see here in a second, Ananias and Sapphira. And what this does is it unveils to us what's really going on behind the scenes. And I think this is also another reason why it's important to read scripture within the entirety of its context. If we were to have started with Acts chapter 5 and just read verses 1 to 11, we would be absolutely lost as to what's going on here. But because just like the early readers that Luke wrote to, they read it in succession. And so they knew exactly what was going on within that particular context. Because now we are going to look at an impure giver. Starting in chapter 5, verse 1. It says, Now a man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira, also sold a piece of property. So what Luke points out is that Barnabas has property and he sold it. And then this couple has a property, and they sold it. And everybody lays it at the apostles' feet. But what Luke's about to show us is what's actually going on inside of Ananias and Sapphira's heart. Because verse 2 says, With his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself, but brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. So what's happening here? So both of them have property they own, and they sell it. Then both get money from that property, 
and they both put it at the apostles' feet. Okay, so just to give an example, let's imagine that Barnabas sold his property for $1,000. He took that 1000 bucks, he brought it to the apostles, and he says, I got this property for $1,000. Here's $1,000 for you guys to use. What Ananias and Sapphira do is they take the money. They, they also have a property. They sell it for $1,000. They take the money. They bring it to the apostles, and they say, we got this property for $700. Here you go. And then they secretly keep $300 for themselves. Do you see the problem that's going on here? So what makes this impure? And I, and I was looking for you know, the right words to use with this sermon, and I felt like impurity was good because impurities deal with contamination, right? So uh, some of you know that one of my favorite TV shows is uh, Alone and, on the History Channel, and even if they're scooping water uh, out of a, a stream that's running, they still boil it because they're afraid to find that although the water looks good, that on the microscopic level, level it might not be fresh because contamination deals with corruption of something that looks pure, but it really isn't. Has anybody seen any political ads lately? Right? That's the whole point. The whole point is that they're like, well, they're really presenting this way, but they're really this way. They're, they're, they look like they're pure, but let me expose for you all the impurities. And so that is what's going on with Ananias and Sapphira, and that's what Luke is trying to unveil to us, is the impurities that are going on behind the scenes, because they have some underlying motives to be generous. Commentators say that a, a likely one is they probably just wanted to have a perception of being generous. They wanted people to look at them in a particular way, like, hey, everybody else is doing, let's get on board and people can see us be this way as well. Now, if you've been around church long enough and you've read the Bible, you have seen the Sermon on the Mount and you would know that Jesus outright condemns that kind of behavior. He says, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. He said, do not do your works of service as to be seen before men because their applause is all you're going to get. He says, rather, do your works in secret so that your heavenly Father will reward you. And so what Ananias and Sapphira are doing, Sapphira are doing is they may be doing it as a perception, but what we absolutely know that they're doing is that they saw it as an opportunity to be profitable. They were making money off appearing generous. And that is the trouble that we have this morning. So let's take a look at what happens, and then I want to unpack it some more. Then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money you received from, uh, for the land, and have kept for yourself some of the money you received for the land? Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you do such a thing? How, you have not lied just to human beings but to God. So, you know, some miraculous way, I'm gonna, just going to hedge a bet basically because we've been studying the book of Acts for the last four chapters, is that the Holy Spirit let him in on what was going on. And he understood and saw the deception and he addressed it in that moment. And, and Peter's line of questioning is very, very interesting because you could kind of see Peter kind of go like, like a parent would with like a teenager. It's like, what made you think of doing such a thing? I say that to my, you know, 10 and 7-year-old all the time. Like, why did you do that? It doesn't even make any sense. But then you can even see Peter's like confused. He's like, I, I don't understand. I, it's like, why did you do this this way? He, you can almost hear him go, <laughs> I mean, he was like, the money was yours while you had it. Like, I don't understand what you did. You, you know what you could have done is if you sold the property for a thousand bucks, you could have come to us and say, hey, we got this property for a thousand dollars. Uh, here's 700 of it for you guys, but we're going to keep 300 for ourselves to reinvest in a new property. Maybe we could sell that one and give you some more as well. That's all they had to do, and they would have been good. But do you want to know what the problem is? Is that the heart of impurity was already there. Do you notice what that text said? It said, with his wife's full knowledge. This was premeditated. This was planned. This is not a clerical error. This is not, I wrote on the, long, the wrong line in my, in my budget sheet. They weren't like, oops, we accidentally sold this for a thousand but kept 300 for ourselves. No, they meant for this to happen this 
particular way? And I think this is a, a fantastic question for us, is why do we give? When we go to give, why do we give? To make it look like it's for somebody else, but when it's really all for us? Tim Keller has a really great uh, illustration he used one time. I think it's very helpful for this context. He talked about the story of this king and this farmer and the king's right-hand man. He said, there was once a king and a kingdom and a farmer came to this king and he brought him a carrot. He said, king, I want you to have this carrot. It is the finest from my crops and I want to give it to you to enjoy. And the king took it from the farmer and he bit into it and he said, this is wonderful. You want to know what I, you want to know what I want to do for you, farmer? I want to give you 10 times more land so that you can grow more crops, be more profitable and share more of what your gift is uh, with the rest of our kingdom. And the, the farmer was absolutely flabbergasted and received that with joy and he went on. But the king's right-hand man was sitting there and he saw that it was favorable for this farmer. So the very next day, the right-hand man brings in a horse. He says, oh oh, great king, this is one of my finest stallions um, that I have and I want you to have it so that you can ride around and look majestic as you do so. And the king had one of his servants come and grab it and the king said thank you and he went on with his day. And the right-hand man stood there kind of little uh, you, know, uh, you know, flabbergasted at what just happened. And the king looked at him and he said, look, let me tell you what happened. Yesterday, the farmer gave me the carrot. Today, you gave yourself the horse. You gave yourself the horse. This is why we need to check our hearts behind why it is that we do what we do. And you notice that Peter does not sugarcoat in any way, shape, or form um, you know, the heart behind this. He calls it for what it, is, for what it is. The first thing he calls it is lying. I've worked with students for so many years and they've been trying to get out of so many situations with their parents and they're like, well, what if I just kind of uh, left this piece of information out of this story? And I said, do you want to know what the definition of lying is? It's the intent to deceive. And they're like, well, when you put it that way, right? It's, you're leaving out what's actually going on within the whole story. It's, it's purposely being inaccurate about what it is that you are presenting. The other thing uh, is that Peter calls it an attempt to deceive God. You cannot trick God, no matter how much you try, okay? You just won't. You will fail 1,000% of the time. And the other thing he points out, which I'll get to a little bit more later, is that points out that Satan is involved in this. How has so Satan filled your heart? So that's the thing, is there is some stuff going on beneath the surface that we need to pay attention to, not only in this passage, but in our own lives as well. I'm going to pick up in verse 5 and read the rest. It said, when Ananias heard this, He fell down and died. And great fear seized all who had heard what had happened. Then some young men came forward, wrapped up his body, and carried him out and buried him. About three hours later, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. Peter asked her, tell me, is this the price you and Ananias got for the land? Yes, she said, that is the price. Peter said to her, how could you conspire to test the the spirit of the Lord? Listen. The feet of the men who buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out also. At that moment, she fell down at his feet and died. Then the young men came in and finding her dead, carried her out and buried her beside her husband. Great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about these events. So as a result of this deception, God brings judgment first on Ananias, and then Peter, as you can see, tries to give her a second chance to come clean, but she doubles down, and as a result of that, God brings judgment. Now, I imagine that in your reading this week, this is the part where all of the questions start to come out. Like, how do we make sense of this? What's going on here? Because sometimes people are like, you know, Uh, Well, you know, sometimes you could go, well, we just read the Gospels and Jesus was talking about love and grace and mercy, and then all of a sudden, people are dropping dead five chapters into the book of Acts. What's going on here? I I don't understand. Let Let me start by saying this. Just remember that the God of the Old Testament is the God of the New Testament too. He's the same God, yesterday, today, and forever. All right? He's still bringing judgment, even more so on his people. If you've 
read the Old Testament, you know that's his primary way of which he shows himself. It's judgment upon his people because they're straying off the, the path that he has them on for holiness. And I know for some people, when they read this, they're like, man, I don't like that God's that way. Listen, I don't care that you don't like it. This is who God is, and this is what he said he did. So we got two things. We can either accept it or we can reject it. Now, I say this as a guy that when I read this for the very first time, I found it difficult to understand. But luckily for me at the time, I was reading out of my NIV study Bible, which has cheat cheat notes at the bottom from made by all these very famous theologians sit down and they think through about like, okay, when these people come across this piece in Acts, how can we help them understand what's going on? And I'm going to read for you in a second what I read that was, I will call it, helpful. It may not comfort you a whole lot because you still have to do that. This is how God worked in history, but it was a comfort to me, or uh, it was helpful to me. It read this. It says, if no dire consequences had followed this act of sin, the results among the believers would have been serious when the deceit became known. Not only would dishonesty appear profitable, but the conclusion that the spirit could be deceived would follow. It was important to set the course properly at the outset in order to leave no doubt that God will not tolerate such hypocrisy and deceit. Take it as you may, that makes sense of why, especially in the early church where people were developing their understandings and trying to figure out what everything, what all of this means, that God would operate in such a way. Now, it also points out that God truly does go, uh, care about what goes on inside our hearts. God, it does matter to him how it is that we intend and with the integrity live our lives. You know, some people say that you should do the right thing even if for the wrong reasons. And I would say in some instances, yeah, for sure you should. But in this instance, I would warn against it. Um, okay, not because I don't want you to do this action and then you start falling dead. Okay, that's not my thing is. What I, what I really want for you guys is I don't want you to become like these kinds of people. I don't want you to be this way. And so I want to caution us a little bit as we consider in our hearts when we go to give. I want to give us five things to caution us when we go to give and to take them to heart and to consider them. And the first one is this, is I, don't, I caution you to give uh, to get in good favor with God. There is a theological teaching out there called the prosperity gospel. It basically is um, an idea that if you, uh, most, what most preachers do is they'll say, if you sow a seed uh, with my ministry, they almost never say like elsewhere, as to go into their pocket. Uh, if you sow a seed with my ministry, God will give you 10 times more. Now, here's what I will say, is that uh, the Bible does teach about ro- uh, sowing and reaping. The Bible does teach that if you, uh, if, if you pour out a blessing, God can pour out a blessing upon you. But let me tell you the difference. The difference is, is that this kind of giving is transactional. Or you think to yourself, well, I'm going to give to God, not because I love God, but because I want God to give me stuff. You're putting gifts above giver. And the real heart behind that. And so I want to keep us away from that transactional kind of thinking. The second is this, is I want to caution us to give so that people will give to you. I, I, you know, I have friends in this church, brothers and sisters in this church who work in businesses. This seems to be almost like a, a rule of thumb within businesses and organizations. You scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. It's a give and take sort of thing. And what Jesus is interestingly says enough in the gospels, he says, you know, when you go to throw a party and a banquet, don't invite people who can pay you back. He says, go and invite people in who can't pay you back. The lame, the poor, all those sorts of things. You can tell tell he's trying to safeguard against becoming the kind of person who tries to use other people to get something back from them because they can give to them. But giving out of the generosity of your heart of those who cannot pay you back is what he is going at. Caution number three to absolve you of sin or guilt. Now, there are some of you in this room who grew up in a particular uh, church background. And in that background, one of the teachings of the church is it says, alms giving saves from death. That you could write a particular sizable check that in giving it, it will absolve you of a certain amount of sin. Now, let me be the one to tell you whether or not you are visiting from that background here today or you are from it. The Bible doesn't 
teach that. Two things. Number one, there ain't no check big enough that you're going to be able to write to cover you in your sin. And number two, it is an absolute affront to the gospel because if you could write a check to absolve you from sin, then Jesus Christ shed his blood for nothing. For nothing. And so let's keep in mind that important thing. And I know some people, they feel like, oh man, I'm just so trapped in that idea and that habit of, man, if I just write this check, I'll feel better about myself. I want to caution us from becoming that kinds of, those kinds of people and straying away from the gospel message. Number four, uh, caution you to say that you gave X amount when you really gave less. It's the Ananias and Sapphira. Be honest about your finances. And number five is, I want to caution us from giving in order to give, uh, get some special treatment in the church. If you ever say the sentence, um, do you know how much money I give to this church? You're doing it wrong. You're doing it wrong. Now, should you keep our church leadership accountable for how you, or for how we uh, handle the money that you guys so graciously give and work hard for that God has blessed you with. Yes, absolutely, hallelujah, amen. And if you've been to an annual meeting, you know that there's plenty of people who do a really good job at that. <laughs> who do a really good job at that, as you, as you should. But what I'm talking about here is that people who say, well, if you don't start promoting this sort of message from the pulpit, I'm pulling out. If you don't start saying this sort of thing, if you don't get something done in this ministry, I'm out of here and I'm taking my bat and my ball and my checkbook with me. That is what I'm talking about. Now, I will say, I haven't heard a whole lot of that that has happened in the church, so good job thus far. But I want to warn us from that because it's not about the church, it's about you and trying to hold the church hostage to get what you want. Do you see that? Now, I want us to caution, I want to give us these cautions because what's really important is not just the action, but I think I want us to keep in mind the kinds of people that we are on the inside. We want to be people who not only desire to be holy on the outside, but also on the inside. Jesus talked to the Pharisees and he said, on the outside, you're like whitewashed tombs, but on the inside, you're dead man's bones. I say this with hyperbole, um, but you can test the theory if you want to. I would rather you give one dollar, just one dollar to this church with a pure heart than a million dollars with an impure heart. I mean, you could test it if you want to, but I'm saying this is who I want you to be. I want you to be the kind of person with the purity of heart who gives and gives and gives because the enemy would love for you to be generous while you also scheme to steal. So what he would love. Now, I know I've been coming a little strong here this morning, okay? I know I've been a little strong. And so as we're going towards the end here, as we are about to enter into communion, I want to give us a couple things before I get to my last point. Is that I want you to know that even in the midst of maybe some conviction here this morning, there's some good things for us. The first is, is this, is that you can find forgiveness in Christ. It's there. He wants to forgive you. He has forgiven you. He just wants to remind you of that being true. <laughs> you can repent and turn back to him. Number two is you can fight the Im impure impulses. And I think sometimes that's half the battle to know we're even in a fight. C.S. Lewis said, he says, the only way you can know the strength of an army is when you start fighting back against it. And the way that you know that you're actually in a battle is not by just laying down and surrendering, but pushing back against it to know you have that fight in you, that when that impulse creeps in, you can push it back down and go against it. Because the third thing you could do is flee to God and ask for, your, for a pure heart. The psalmist says, create in me a pure heart, O God, and give me a, a righteous spirit within me. I want what you want. I want to desire what you desire amongst all things. And last but not least is this, is focus on giving out without getting back. There are some of you in this room who I know personally uh, that would give whatever they need to give and not ask any questions and just give because you saw that the need was there. And I remember one time we had a missions need and uh, Mark was having a conversation with somebody uh, and not, I think it was the very next day that person wrote a check for $27,000 to fill the gap between the mission need. Just like that. It's a beautiful picture of who we can be in the purity of our heart. Because the point is not about either being like Barnabas or Ananias and Sapphira. The point is whether or not we are going to be like the deceiver or like Jesus Christ. 
Why was the early church so sacrificial in its giving? The clue comes for us in Acts chapter 4, verse 33, when they talked about how the apostles testified to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. The only way they could testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus is if they also talked about his death. And if they're talking about a death, they're going to talk about the reason why he died. Why is he the purest giver? Why did the early church respond in such a way to the gospel message to so freely give and so purely give unto one another? Because they saw their Savior do it first. They saw their Savior do it first. So we are called to be like him. Who is he? He is the one that created everything. Every beautiful sunrise you've ever seen every beautiful mountaintop you've ever climbed to, every piece uh, of, uh, of jewelry you've ever owned, that rock belongs to him. There's not a thing that we can't look around at where Jesus doesn't say, that is mine. We're getting, we're getting beamed in photos from the other side of the galaxies of things that doesn't even com- we can't even comprehend and understand. And Jesus goes, that's mine. It all belongs to me. Your very blood, your very life, your very soul, it is his. It's his. And because he's the one who created it, it all has infinite value and worth. And yet, it's still not the most valuable thing in all of our existence. Do you want to know what is? He is. He is the most valuable thing in all of the universe. He is a giant golden mountain in a valley full of rusty copper coins in comparison to creation. And yet the Bible tells us, the Bible tells that that he who did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, he made himself nothing, taking on the very nature of a servant and he emptied himself. Why? For you and for me. For you and for me. And he saw our debt of sin stacked miles high to the other side of the galaxy and he looked at it and he says, I can pay it all. Bring it all to me. Put it on my back. I have the resources to pay it. And he came down low with us in our poverty, in our, and walked with us despite our sinfulness. And he gave of his love, and he gave of his life, and he gave of his breath, and he gave of his blood. Why? Because he loves you. It says, he who was rich became poor so that we could be rich unto God. And that is the gospel that so changed the heart of the early church that made them look at what they had and said, this doesn't even belong to me. It's, everything is God and I want to give it all to him and give it all to the, his people so that there will be no needy people among us, pouring out in such a way the kingdom of God. And that is the God that we worship. And that's why the early church with, the, with such purity of heart gave what they had because they saw their savior do it first. And that is, why with we, that is why we, with the purity of heart, should give to God and to his people and into this world. And what makes Jesus the purest giver? It's because there's nothing that we can give back to him that he needs from us. He is everything. We have nothing we can add to him. What makes him the purest giver is that he did it not because he wanted to manipulate us to give back to him. He doesn't need anything from us, but he does want us because he loves us. And with that on our hearts and mind, we're going to trans- transition into communion. When we think about the fact and reflect on sometimes, I, listen, I know with communion, it's like, all right, I got this bread, I'm going to eat it. I got this cup, I'm going to drink it. All right, I'm going through the motions. We do this once a month. Fantastic, cool. This is an opportunity to slow down a little bit and use this as a time that Jesus actually meant it for. To remember. To remember what he did for me and what he did for you because he loves us. And so with that on our hearts and our minds, let us transition into communion and let me pray for us. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done, Lord, and by what we have left undone. 
Lord, we have not loved you with our whole heart and we have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. And Lord, we do truly and humbly repent before you for the sake of your son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, Lord, so that we may delight in your will, that we would walk in your ways, all to the glory of your name. Remind us of that here this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.